When I was just a kid, every couple of months or so, my family would go and visit my grandma and grandpa Kajeski. And when I was just a little kid, we're talking toddler, two, three years old, my great-grandma Kulos lived with my grandma and grandpa Kajeski. And I'm a little embarrassed to admit this. I'm not proud of this. As a toddler, I was absolutely terrified of my great-grandma Kulos. Now, it wasn't as if I had this thing against the elderly. I'm very grateful for all the wisdom that has been shared with me by the elderly folks in my life. However, as a toddler, I was a little two-year-old, and I would look up at this woman who was wholly other than me, who wore her age very proudly on her face. Like, as a two-year-old, I looked at her and I thought, well, God made Adam and Eve, and poof, all of a sudden, out pops Grandma Kulos, and here she is still today. As a little kid, I was absolutely terrified of her as I looked at her, my small, tiny figure, her larger one. But more than that, more than anything, the thing that scared me the most about Great Grandma Kulos, she did not speak a word of English. My Great Grandma Kulos only spoke Polish, but I was a little two-year-old kid, like I didn't even understand the English language yet. So for me, there's this woman who's speaking Polish. I didn't even grasp that there could be other languages, right? So when she's speaking, all that I'm thinking is she's making these complex grunting noises, and, and I'm terrified of that. Like, I, she was completely alien to me to the degree I literally remember as a toddler wondering if she was like the aliens that I saw in Star Wars. I was so very afraid of her. But the trouble with this is simply that I was the little one. I was the toddler. I was the baby of the family. I had lots and lots of cousins who were close to my age. I had an older sister who wasn't that much older than me. But we all know this. We all love toddlers. Parents of toddlers, I know it's probably frustrating sometimes. But every other one of us, we look at these little kids and we're like, man, all I see is a future there. I see this little ball of energy that is absolutely full of life. Like, I'm a 28-year-old man. I'm single. Kids scare the snot out of me. But toddlers, I'll hang out with them all day. I was the toddler, and because of that, I was the one that Great Grandma Kulos always wanted to see. So Grandma Kajeski would always find reasons to go and send me to speak with Great Grandma Kulos. I was like Grandma Kajeski's chosen messenger to deliver the good news of whatever was going on in my life to Great Grandma Kulos. And it was literally whatever. Like Grandma Kajeski would say, hey, Jordan, you got a new toy? Go show that to Great Grandma Kulos. And I'd sit there like, oh, no. No, no, I don't want to. Or, Jordan, hey, here's some candy. Go share it with Great Grandma Cool Awesome. Be like, oh, no, 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 no. I was so scared. Like, to the degree my stomach would rise in my throat, I would feel sick. I am 28 years old, and I still vividly remember these images. I can remember the toys I was supposed to show to her. I can remember the candy I was supposed to share with her. From the time I was two years old, because I was so terrified that this was ingrained in my mind to this day. I was this chosen messenger, but I was a really reluctant messenger. And so, while my, I'm sure my great-grandma Kulos was a lovely woman, and if I could have understood her, she probably would have been telling me how much she loved me. Because I was so afraid, I would go, I would complete whatever task I was supposed to complete, show her whatever I was supposed to show her, and immediately run away, usually without saying a word. That was a great struggle for me as a child, and unfortunately, I think that can be a great struggle for us in the church today, too. We are God's chosen messengers to this world. We are given the good news of the gospel, and we are sent out to share it with this world. And that is a beautiful, beautiful thing. However, sometimes this world can be wholly other to us. Sometimes we are presented with people who act different, who live differently, and sometimes that can be intimidating to us. Just acknowledging psychologically things that are different sometimes scare us. The great struggle, then, is simply that we have this great and beautiful task to be the messengers of this good news. However, sometimes in our fear, we keep that good news to ourselves and, like me as a toddler, run away. Now, all this Advent season, we've talked about the good news of the precious gift of Jesus Christ. We've celebrated his coming into this world. And today, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. We're going to go into Matthew 1, 22 through 23, recounting the birth of Jesus, reading, All this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. In the Advent season, 
we celebrate this good news, this promise of Emmanuel that God is with us. And all throughout this Advent season, we've been very blessed to have Pastor Joel and Pastor Tony share with us just some really wonderful things about what Advent means to us. Now today, myself and the rest of the pastoral team sitting here are going to be sharing how the Advent season applies to us. Now, we've just talked about, we begin the Advent season with the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. The book of Matthew begins with the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. Now we're going to move ahead a little bit and read how the book of Matthew ends. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 reads, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always even to the end of the age. This is the charge. Jesus sends his disciples, his chosen messengers, to carry the good news of the gospel into the world. How does this relate to Advent? Well, we just talked about Advent begins with the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. And the very end of this passage, this promise is continued when Jesus says, and be sure of this, I am with you always to the end of the age. Do you see it? Advent begins with the promise of Emmanuel, God with us. The great commission, our great task in this world is to simply continue that promise and share it with the rest of the world. You see, in the Advent season, we hear of Emmanuel, God with us, which should necessarily lead to Emmanuel, God with us them, with those people who are other than us, because if God is with us when we are sent, when we go to these other people, God is present with them too. It's a beautiful thing. We share this good news, and even though sometimes that's scary, we have even more good news in the promise that is present there when Jesus says, I am with you always to the end of the age. Because me, even as a toddler, even as a two-year-old, when I was presented with the terror of great-grandma Kulos, if my mom, my dad, even my older sister would have just walked over there with me, would have grabbed my hand and walked with me, I wouldn't have been afraid anymore. Because I would have had somebody who I knew loved me deeply and who would protect me no matter what with me. I think this Advent season we get to celebrate that too. When we go out into this world, God is with us holding our hands every step of the way to the very end of the age. At Advent, we receive the promise, Emmanuel, God with us. And God with us should necessarily lead to God with them. Because in order to apply Advent, we must acknowledge that we are also sent. So we're not only sent, we're sent with a purpose. You ever played with a hula hoop? Anybody? Hands? Yes? Aren't they super fun, super embarrassing? And we're not going to do that today. But remember those days? And um, I'm very good at a hula hoop. I can put it around my waist and it promptly falls to the floor. But um, I'm pretty good at the Wii version if you've ever done that because there's no actual hula hoop. So hula hoops. We're going we're gonna to set this right here for right now. Now, um, in the course of preparing for this part of this message, I learned that hula hoops aren't just for fun and games, but there's some relevant teaching techniques where hula hoops are used as a means of teaching children personal space. So the child, actually I'll grab that again, the child will put the hula hoop around their waist to learn that this is their personal space. And they have choices of who can and cannot get into that personal space, and it also just helps with general social interactions as well, too. Now, personal space is not just a child's thing because each of us has a personal space too. And um, sometimes you call it your bubble. The, that in some, and I know some people like to burst bubbles. Some people have large bubbles. Some people have small bubbles. Um, but there are people who are in our bubbles all the time. Some of those are friends and family. We might let them to be. We, we might let them be very close in our bubbles. We might let them. Um, 
be close to us emotionally and physically. Some people um, in our lives we keep very far away from us, or we'd prefer that they, you know, stay outside of our space bubble. If you've ever been in a crowded elevator, you know that that can feel very uncomfortable because people are crowding in on your space. Um, sometimes I, when I'm shopping, I feel like my, the whole aisle is my space. And if someone walks in, I feel very taken aback. What do I do? You came up next to me. Uh, I was looking at that. Don't you know? Has, maybe I'm alone in this, but your laughter seems to suggest otherwise. Sometimes we allow people into our space and we allow them to be very close to us, maybe through a hug or through a handshake. Um, sometimes when someone passes in front of you while you're standing in line, you allow them to be close to you, but they're not invading your space because it's you're okay with that. All these are appropriate ways of uh, people being allowed into your personal space bubble. So hold on to that thought. In the New Testament book of Acts, we meet a group of people that are labeled as the apostles, and they're the first followers of Jesus. And early on, these folks were just culturally Jewish, and mostly all Jewish, and um, just like Jesus was, too. In Acts chapter 3, it mentions that two of these apostles, Peter and John, are on their way to pray at the Jewish temple, and they meet a man who seems to be completely unable to walk. And what the Bible says is that He's, un he's been unable to walk since birth. It's likely that Peter and John knew this man very well, especially if they went to temple very often, which they likely did. Um, and they also, they probably knew his name. They knew him um, from their entire lives of seeing this man stay there too. This day was probably a lot like many other days. Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you, Peter. Good to see you, John. Except... This man's day changed when he talked to Peter and John. Peter got his attention and in response, this man seems to act like, oh, I'm going to get something financially or a gift from you. But Peter's response to this man was quite different. Peter didn't give this man money or um, any sort of other gift, but he gave him a chance at new life. He said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And just like that, it's a miracle. A miracle happens. This man leaps up and walks. He takes Peter's hand and starts walking around as if walking had been a normal part of his everyday experience. But he's not just walking here. He jumps. He runs. He chases after Peter and John into the temple. And his testimony of what happened spread far and wide. And so, so many were amazed by what had happened to him. There have been times this past year when we've discussed people who seem to be people of prayer. Um, we've mentioned Daniel before. We've mentioned Nehemiah in particular. While this section of Acts chapter 3 does not mention that Peter and John are, are praying before this happens, the section right before does. It says that the apostles were devoted to prayer. Devoted to prayer in Acts 2.42. So we can infer that Peter and John's Actions here were fueled by such devout and passionate prayer. Yet miraculous acts of healing, such as what happened to this man, are not only fueled by prayer, but also by the compassion of Christ. Such compassion is often mentioned right before Jesus performs a miracle to heal someone or to bring someone back to life. Compassion moved the heart of Christ into action. Compassion and prayer. These two things are highlights of how Jesus and the apostles interacted with the people around them. And I think that there are to be highlights of how we handle the interactions with the people around us as well. In Romans 12, 13, 12 and 13, the writer of the Apostle Paul says, To be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now, hospitality here is the practice and the passionate pursuit of welcoming the stranger in your midst. Or let's say, welcoming the person who comes into your hula hoop space bubble. But it's not only just welcoming, it's welcoming with compassion and prayer. It's easy to make excuses, I think, for me at least, when it comes to prayer and compassion and hospitality. It's easy to say, oh, well, those aren't my gifts and graces. I'll let someone else do that, please. Um, or... 
to say that, well, my life, my space, my house is too full or too busy or too messy, so I can't let other people come in and see that. Or to say, those tasks are siloed to committees on, at the church or to other people. Other people are doing really great with that, so I don't need to do that as well. But anytime that we welcome someone into our space, whether it's our homes, our schools, or even our aisles at Meijer and Walmart, or just into the hula hoop space around us, our personal space, we have this opportunity to practice prayer and compassion and hospitality. Now, if I think about it like this, I get overwhelmed. It's overwhelming to think that I have to pray for every single person on the world and to be compassionate and give to every single good cause that I come across or to welcome every single person that comes into my space. That's overwhelming. But I, I do think we have this chance that those who do come into our space, it doesn't have to be every single person that you've ever met, ever. But those who do come into your space, we have this opportunity to welcome them with hospitality. It's those people that we bump into in the day-to-day -day life. Sometimes people, sometimes people have talked to me about forgetting to pray or their prayer life. They want to go deeper, but they're not quite sure yet. And, or they felt really guilty about not praying in the past. And it, it can apply to compassion, too. And I usually tell them that there's fresh grace, there's fresh mercy each day. Today is a great day to start again. It's a great day to pray again, to have compassion, to practice hospitality. Much like when you drive, if you drive, I know some people in here haven't, don't have their license yet. But when you drive, you have this acceleration period. You don't go from zero miles, to hour, miles per hour to 55 or 70 miles per hour Im immediately. There's this period of acceleration where you have to get faster as you go along. And I think growing in prayer, growing deeper in prayer, and praying for longer periods of time has an acceleration period too. You can't just instantly pray for two hours at a time, the deepest prayer you've ever prayed. There's this acceleration period too. It takes time and practice, so don't give up. Keep trying. Keep praying. Pray where you are. Pray for God to bless those who are sitting at the table at the restaurant next to you. Pray for God to bring comfort and healing and, and people who are able to help in times of emergencies or, or when someone's at a funeral. Pray for Jesus to be real to the students and teachers at the places where you pass, the schools that you pass every single day. Hospitality isn't just for those that we know who can reciprocate with their friendship. Hospitality, prayer, and compassion are for all who share our space, our friends and neighbors, and our enemies and strangers. In Advent, Jesus came for us, but he didn't just come for us to keep him to ourselves, to keep the gospel of hospitality, prayer, and compassion to ourselves. Jesus sends us too. We are sent out to be people of compassion, people of prayer, and namely people of hospitality. So I leave you with this question. Who's in your hula hoop? How do you guys feel about tag team preaching? Isn't it fun? I, don't, I, I wish you could see some of the behind the scenes stuff because we wanted to build a wrestling ring and tag, you know how, run, jump over the top rope and, but my didn't work. <laughs> You ever watch uh, Sesame Street? They would do that that little that little bit. One of these things just doesn't belong here. One of these things isn't quite the same. Soccer ball, football, baseball, and then an umbrella. Young person, young person, young person, umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about what do we do with Advent? Why is it important? Who are we? in this process. Why did Jesus come? He came so that we could go. That's the sermon. And each of us is taking a little part of that. Pastor Jordan says, we're not going alone. Jesus is with us and he is there. Pastor Emily says, take that giant call that God has given to us and put it in our circle. Minister to those around us. You know, that's what Jesus did. The most important person in Jesus's life was the person he was in front of. This is good stuff. I hope you're, hope you're taking notes. I'm going to be a little bit more corporate. I'm going to talk about unity. 
Because we're in this together. We're doing it individually, but we're in this together. And it takes every single one of us to be a part of it. I brought a, I brought a football. I went out on the front porch and I grabbed this. Uh, and it's a little squishy. It's signed by Tom Brady. It's a deflate. <laughs> <laughs> that was for you, Jordan. Sorry about that. <laughs> I know, I know, I have no room to talk. <laughs> On a football team, the purpose of a football team is to score more points than the opponents. And New England does that better than anybody else. Everybody in the organization does that for the same goal, to score more points than the other team. The guys sweeping the floors are making a clean place to practice so the guys that are practicing can score more points than the other team. In the game itself, there's a, a front line of big beefy guys who are running into other big beefy guys to push them out of the way so that they can get the ball to the end zone to score more points than the other team. And if you watch football, You'll see a play, a running play, where they're going to take the football and they're going to hand it to a, a smaller guy who's going to squeeze through the big fat guys and run the ball. But there's guys on the end, the receivers. They're running their routes like they're going to get a pass. Their job on that play is to get the corners and the safeties attention on them so there'll be room in the middle of the field for the running back to run. Their goal is to score more points than the other person. Simple. Everybody has their job. The linemen, the quarterback, the running back, the receivers, they're all doing something to score points. And it's interesting because it's divided up into offense and defense and special teams. And then there's guys on the practice squad that practice with the starters. There's guys in, the, in an office looking at videotape of what's going on with the other guys. All kinds of stuff happening, but the play happens on the field. What are we doing? Our purpose at Brookhaven is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lost world. Jesus came so that we can go. I'm going to read to you from Philippians chapter 2. This is Paul writing, Paul and Timothy. And it sums up perfectly. And I love the language that's used on purpose. Uh, let, let me just read it and then I'll back up a little bit. Therefore, if any of you, us, many of us, if any of you have encouragement from being united with Christ, any comfort from his love, if any communion, any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. There's a ton of more good stuff following that, so go read it. Philippians chapter 2. He uses the word any. If you have any compassion, any love, any connection with Christ. And I think they do that on purpose because there are times in our lives when we don't feel like it, when we're whooped, when life beats us down, when we're drained, when we're worried, all those sort of stuff. But we have some we have some love. And then those people are walking around who are just completely overflowing with God's grace and his love and his joy abounds abundantly in them. This writer's talking to both of us, to both groups. If you got a little bit, if you got a ton of it, our purpose is to be united in what God has called us to do. We have to be united. We're on the same team. We're all doing the same thing for the same purpose is so that we can share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. And it takes all of us to do it. We have to be united. We are united in a 
mission and a common vision together. Uh, many times from this very platform, Pastor Tony has shared uh, or painted a picture of what would it look like if God wanted to use Brookhaven Wesleyan to reach hundreds, if not thousands of people in our community. Positioned here kind of equidistant from Gas City on one side, Marion on the other. What would it look like? What would that vision be like if God really wanted to use us to reach hundreds, if not thousands of people in our community? During this holiday season, one of the, the highlights for me was getting together with my brother and my nephews and going to see the new Star Wars movie. That's the thing to do, right? How many of you have seen the new Star Wars film? Uh, about a fifth, maybe. Okay, interesting. Uh, I won't spoil anything for you today, I promise, because I have I just have very passionate feelings about spoilers, and I'm not going to say anything. However, I do want to borrow an illustration from the original trilogy. So it's been 40 years, so if you've not seen Star Wars, there's like a statute of limitation on these things. So I, I <laughs> you gotta, you gotta go. Um, when I was 10 years old, I went to a friend's house and I borrowed a recorded VHS tape. They had recorded a Star Wars marathon, like a Christmas Day Star Wars marathon, off of, off of the TV. And so my first experience with Star Wars was this low quality VHS tape. Uh, fast forwarding through the commercials, I knew where all the you know commercials were, so I fast forward. And that was my experience with it. And despite kind of this subpar viewing experience, I loved it. I was so immersed in the world. I went out and bought the books, the movies, the t-shirts, the board games, everything I could get my hands on to immerse myself in this universe. And Star Wars uh, fixates on this very classic story arc of, of good, uh, good versus evil. And in the movie, you have on the one hand, the evil galactic empire, you know, conquering the universe through uh, terror and torture and enslavement and even genocide. They are the, the big, bad, evil empire. And on the other hand, you have this ragtag alliance of uh, rebels. They are under-equipped. They are underfunded. They are under-manned. They are technologically inferior to the very well-equipped, very well-established empire. And throughout the course of the movies, this rebellion faces insurmountable odds. At every turn, there is uh, some new big obstacle. Everything is against them. And they face all these discouragements along the way. And because of that, the result is that when they, when they achieve a victory, when something good happens, man, the celebration is, is crazy because they're the underdogs, right? And so when something good happens, the high is way up here. And then when bad stuff happens, when they have to run into hiding, when they lose friends, when people are killed, when bad things happen, the lows are really low. They're very discouraged. They're, they're on the, the defensive suddenly. And the, as we face a new year and think about vision and think about New Year's resolutions and uh, things we want to accomplish, what is God's vision for our church? What are we called to do united together? I think I view things like that, kind of like the, rebe the, the rebellion did the empire. You see the task at hand and the insurmountable odds or the difficulties along the way and think, oh my goodness, that, that's too much. That's too difficult. And before I know it, I may have kind of talked myself out of it because it's too much. I would not have survived in the rebellion. I wouldn't have made a good rebel because I, I would have been the guy on the sidelines saying, no, it's, we can't do it. The odds are, there's no way we can do that. It's too difficult. During the Christmas season, we talk about this message, Emmanuel, God with us, this good news of great joy that will be for all people. And yet, during the Christmas season, I found myself uh, reading John 16 several times. And in John 16, Jesus is speaking with his disciples, and he says, in this world, you're going to have trials, you're going to have tribulation. And to his disciples there, he says, a time's coming when you're going to be scattered. A time is coming when people are going to try to kill you and think they're doing a good thing. And I read that and wonder, well, this is a real downer for Christmas. What happened to this good news, this great joy that's going to be for all people? Here Jesus is bringing a much more somber message. And as I was reflecting on that, I thought, I wonder where else in the New Testament we see this, this kind of message. Where else is this word used in the New Testament? These trials, this tribulation is, is the word there. 
And so I did a search and ended up in Romans 8. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, is writing. And if you know anything about Paul's life, you know that he experienced tribulation. This is a man who had been falsely accused, someone who had been imprisoned, somebody who had been rejected, cast out, who faced opposition at various points in his life. And in the middle of that, Paul writes to the church in Rome and he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors, even in the midst of trials and tribulations. When I first watched Star Wars, I watched it with an anxiousness, a tension, because I didn't know what was going to happen. And every victory, I was like, oh, this is awesome. And then Empire Strikes Back hits, and you're like, oh my goodness, this is terrible. Everybody's dying. Everybody's getting, like, this is bad. And you feel the tension as you go along. But now as an adult, when I watch them, I still enjoy the movies thoroughly. But I do so for a different reason, because now I, I see the big picture and I see the movies through a different lens because I know how the story ends, right? You know at the end of the movies what's going to happen, right? You know, you know. The, oh, oh, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know the good guys win in the end. Sorry, it's a spoiler. Um, so when Paul writes to the church and he says, in all these things, these trials and the tribulations, we are more than conquerors in Christ. And when Jesus is talking to his disciples in John 16, he says, you will face in this world trials and sorrow, but, but, he says, take courage. I have overcome the world. See, we know that God has written the final episode of the story, right? Jesus wins. Jesus wins in the end. And that's the good news that we take with us. That is the message that is with us. And that's the message we take to the people in our circles, bringing people in to that message. And if we did that together, united for a common cause, and do so with a courage, if not even almost a reckless boldness because we know in the end that Jesus is victorious. This morning we're going to get to celebrate communion. And as we do so, um, I encourage you to do so remembering that we are celebrating the message that was given to us, but also celebrating that we know how the story ends. This is this bridge for communion, both of these things at once, both the sending out, the receiving of the message, and the sending out. Paul goes on to write in Romans 8, We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, Paul writes, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the message we've received, the message that we need to take to the people around us and to do so together with a courage, knowing that God goes with us and in the end, Christ wins. So with that, we will celebrate and observe communion this morning, Pastor Tony.